is they establish benchmarks for students, places where, and they identify, okay, this student is weak on um, solving quadratic equations, or this student is weak on calculating the area of circles. So they identified very specifically what the students' weaknesses were, and then they required the students to go to the achievement center to get assistance. And there were kids from AP to, to our, our most challenging level classes, to our remedial classes, and everything in between, who were just swamping the achievement center for the first two months of the year, uh, getting assistance with those areas. And in the past, we have not been able to be, partially that's that we've administered the assessments this time for the first time, uh, and partially is that there are that access is available in the achievement center to be able to catch all kids. Some of them loved it, some of them hated it, but I think all of them got through ultimately. If I may continue, you, you're also doing assessments on reading, writing, and research. Yes. How, when you find defects or deficiencies, I should say, um, how do you address that? Yeah. Uh, those, those have been more um, curricular and instructional changes. For example, our social studies and English departments have been spending a significant amount of time recently um, looking at the research assessments, finding out where our students in general are strong. Um, and then figuring out, okay, where do we need to plug these things in? Because honestly, that's an area where we have been less systematic than we should have been. So it's not necessarily a matter of, okay, we have to remediate a particular student in a particular area. It's we have to make sure that all kids are being hit on these core research skills. And the same thing is happening um, in connection with the reading and writing assessments as well. It has been a long process, I will say, and I have promised parents a couple of times and too early that the results of those assessments will be on the portal. We're very close to being able to do that. Uh, it's been a learning curve for us to figure out how do we go about fairly establishing benchmarks. And, and is that doing, more reliable than a check is in the mail? Or? Yes, yeah, yes. It'll, it will happen. Um, do you have any plans to expand this beyond those three core writing, reading, writing, research, and math? At this point, we do not have any plans for that. Not to say you won't, but those are the areas at this point. Okay, and uh, just to make it, I'll be redundant, but it's called, actually it's called, uh, there's a psychological term for it. Um, but it, it's, the key to all this is we're improving all levels of uh, kids uh, through the use of the achievement center, through the use of teachers voluntarily giving up a free period. Um, all of this is being done at no cost. That's correct. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I think this question is for you, Jeff. The, the superintendent's narrative has a reduction of 1.5 teaching positions. I know there's a decline in enrollment at Pond Cove, and one of those positions is at Pond Cove. Um, but I couldn't find the other half of position. Is that in the high school? Not to my knowledge. It's at Pond Cove also. We used a half of, uh, we used some federal stimulus money for a half a reading teacher last year. Right. So that the one and a half positions are coming out of Palm Coal. Federal funding again that we're using has disappeared. Okay, so the federal funding has disappeared and the half a reading teacher is right. Is the I didn't mention this before, but we'll, we'll, we have seven fourth grades this year, we'll have six next year. And the other half will be the Instructional support fund. We have added a half-time teacher concentrated on uh, kindergarten. Okay. Thank you. Are uh, there questions? Um, how is that? How is the reading? How is that teaching in the world? How is it? How do you support that? We, we, we have to basically live with it and take what we have and redistribute it. What we try to do is what Jeff is doing, get the you know, a benchmark a little more finely grained there. So we'll, when we, when the budget is passed, we'll see what we have for reading support to do that. Uh, I'm convinced that our work with Danny and Claire through uh, the Katie Five Capsules will help with that. So it won't be quotas for each grade. We'll have the data and the information to show where the needs are. We did that this year, uh, the beginning of grade two, we had a collection of kids who were not supposed to get smart, but they got more attention than they would have before. And we were, I think 80% of them are now on benchmark. Um, I think it's important to 
questions for Jeff before so. Okay, who's next? Instructional support. Hey. Instructional support this year. Um, first, I just want to thank Gary and all his crew for um, Google Docs and Google websites, and the whole thing has really helped. Um, all the teachers and staff, all staff members, and including my first highlight was the survey, the instruction support survey that Gary helped me create, which goes out with, and most, everything in our office here at uh, Central Office goes out to parents. It goes electronically where we save money on mail and stamps, but the, there's a survey that goes out to parents that just had an IEP meeting, and so the data that came in as of when I wrote this um, was basically we have a 90% satisfaction rate. And there's certain questions in that, and I can certainly show you guys that. It's very good data. So uh, we're making our customers raving fans for instructional support. <laughs> so I thought that was great. Um, a lot of the ARA funds that we keep talking about that have disappeared for instructional support or special education, we really use those um, to really ramp up our curriculum for the last couple of years. Assessment, programming, research-based methodology and interventions that has worked seamlessly. Um, with that halftime position that we were just talking about with Suzanne and Pond Cove, um, all the way up into the high school and the middle school. Uh, we spent a lot of time, we've had a lot of new regulations, special ed regulations, main care regulations, uh, 504 new regulations that we've had to do a lot of professional development on. Main care is actually a highlight for us. Um, as Ken was talking about, we did, we have $400,000 roughly in reserves um, from last year, and that was the main care rules from last year, and it was a bundled rate, which which was great. Now it's unbundled with the new regulations. I'm not even going to get into it. It's very technical, but I really have to thank um, our staff for diving into these new regulations and starting um, with our technology to bill for uh, main care for students with main care. Um, and as of February 1st, this is the numbers have gone up because we actually have more money. I think we're closer to. 75, maybe to close to 80,000. Um, most of the school districts around the state have received no money at all because it's so complicated, um, and we really chase this money um, because we know how important it is for budget time. Uh, but at that time, there was only $60,000 for all the state of Maine for all the schools that were brought in. 40,000 was brought in by Cape Elizabeth. That, that number's probably gone up. I haven't checked with that. But last year, schools around Maine pulled in 25 million. So you can see that there's not a lot of money going to school systems, and most school systems budget zero. So what we're est estimating about, I'd like to see 125,000, which is what we're doing this right we can bring in this year. Um, the last highlight is the high incident population. And again, every year I talk about this. Um, in table three, you can really see um, since um, I, I started five years ago, autism rate has doubled the multiple disabilities area has doubled, and our special education population has stayed roughly the same if you look at some of the table one, where it's basically 180 students. But out of those 180 students, they're not really low incidence, which is really typical learning disabilities or speech language kids. These kids are, that are more high incidence, so they have more one-on-ones, they have more needs, they have more direct instruction, which um, we use the ARA funds for the last couple of years to offset these um, increased costs, which I'm going to get into. Uh, with the budget. Review of budget history. Just last year we tried to stay at a zero uh, base. Uh, we actually re reduced last year two ed techs. But with move-ins, um, and as John, I always, li I remember what John said uh, last year, I think. It's actually a good thing when we have a lot of move-ins coming into Cape Elizabeth. It shows that we're a good school system. But we do have significant amount of move-ins. Um, I have a new student coming in from California with Asperger's with a one-on-one. -on -one. So that's coming in um, at the end of the month. So we're going to, you know, move the furniture type of type of stuff and with staff. So we're going to work with that. Um, but we had to add in what's important about it, we had to add in because of child development services (CDS) the incoming kindergartens. Uh, some parents moved into the district with some high incident kids, and we had to put a couple ed techs back into the budget. So um, we're going to stay at 34 this year in this proposed budget. Um, last year we had an out-of-district placement for a student that's been in with us for a long time. I can't really go into the details, but this year we had a couple students at the high school that we needed to outplace, um, and that was at, uh, another 72,000. 
the ARA funds that we use that I talked about um, was for the last couple of years. Those, that was that half a literacy RTI person that you guys were talking about. Um, and what, in all the work, another huge highlight is the literacy committee. I can't, I know Tom talked about that before. That's really helped work seamlessly with all, both regular ed and special ed. Um, and so that last installment of RF funds is, is complete as of this year. And we have to spend it by September, correct? Um, yes. Or we lose it. Uh, so proposed summary budget for next year. Um, so based on those high incident kids that have moved in, we had to increase the budget of the last couple of years. That 140000 needs to be moved back, um, uh, which includes staffing and contract services. In addition, we will still, will still receive the federal IDA local entitlement monies. These are historically coming in. That's about $363,000. Um, we, have we have to continually shuffle that. Um, and that is also linked to main care because we can't use staff that are billing main care. We can't double debt. So Pauline and I are constantly moving around staff to make sure that we're not using staff that also bill for main care. Um, and our out of district costs budget will be about $110,000 for two students. Uh, one of the students um, will be um, exiting and graduating this year. That is currently in this year's budget. So as you can see, that we're going to keep the same amount of staff in table one. And in addition, those are our related service people that we definitely use. Um, speech and language, OT, social workers, and psychology, we all bill main care for as well. Um, and as you the only table in table two, student enrollments is again like I talked about. The other thing, the other increase area, and I talked about that last year is 504, and that is also increasing based on those new regulations. Table three I talked about, and the last one uh, for table four is uh, a great Google Doc that uh, some of the directors uh, and I have worked together to put in a per student um, per pupil cost comparison. So as you can see, we're right in line with um, Falmouth uh, and Gorham, who we do a lot of work with, Kate does, um, and also Yarmouth. Um, but you know, Yarmouth's at 20,000, so we're at 14, so it's $6,000 difference. So I think we're doing pretty well. Right, Mr. Murphy? If I stay here long enough, we'll get close to 20,000. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's a good perk. So I think we're doing really well, and I think that's the, that, again, accounts for all the seamless work that we um, do together as teams. And that's what I to say. Questions for Don? Uh, at the beginning, I probably should have asked earlier, but uh, Medicaid, you know, it was 125000 And as mentioned, you know, um, I was just understand is that uh, how does that work? If you, I would imagine services are incurred, so is it uh, cumulative, so you can actually, the next year follow? In other words, if you don't go after that money this year, do you lose it? Uh, well, we're supposed to. Um, the Department of Ed has, and again, this DHHS, and you've got Department of Ed, and they say different things. Where DOE has mandated us to bill for this, even though some school districts are not, because um, it takes up, I would probably spend half of my time doing work, doing this work, but I think now it's going to be paying off. But the 125000 is from two years ago, correct, Pauline? It's, yes. Right, and that's, yeah, it's partial. So we, that was under the bundled type of regulations where we could just bill based on attendance. Now it's much more complicated. We, and so OT, PT, speech and language, Social workers, ed techs, we all have to go in and bill separately for certain things, and it goes through our computer program. Um, I hope I'm answering your question. So we, we, we really are going after most of the money that we can for the small amount of kids that we have. So, you know, maybe Medicaid and main care are, should look at it combined a little bit? Or um, Me Medicaid is the, and I hope I'll do it. I might have to look into this, but May Medicare is the federal version of, and then main care pulls those regulations in. So we're, re we're actually building DHHS for main care services. So the reason, it, I was just trying to clarify the, the comment, is that it's going from 125,000 to zero. Can you, can you tell us what?